This is a presentation on how can Bitcoin defeat the cabal? Most people these days are familiar with the reverse side of the Great Seal of the United States. It's all seeing eye, the pyramid that represents society, and the phrase Novus Ordu Seclorum, and its direct translation into English meaning New Order of the Ages. That is thought to allude to the creation of a totalitarian one world government referred to as the New World Order. Those in the know will already understand the significance of the birth certificate and how it turned us into stock. The implications of the Sestuque V Act of 1666 and how they enslave us through trickery into contracting with them through the use of our surnames. The surname, translated into Latin being Serepo, and the all caps letters representing our corporate entities that they've created for us, which enables them to treat us as cargo the moment we accept responsibility for our maritime titles such as Mr, Mrs, Ms, etc and use the documents they create to identify ourselves. They have great fun at our expense when we identify ourselves using the passports as Type P, which stands for pauper, but they often refer to it jokingly as pleb or peasant. It's the Vatican and the SEC that ultimately control and manage our birth certificates. And this is why the all-seeing eye of the Illuminati and New World Order started appearing on the back of $1 notes in 1935, shortly after the creation of the SEC in 1934. It's through their central banking system and the control of the creation of currency that they intend to enslave humanity. It was Henry Kissinger who said, who controls the food supply controls the people, who controls the energy can control whole continents, who controls money can control the world. And Nathan Rothschild was quoted as saying, I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England to rule the empire on which the the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control the British money supply. These people have known the significance of money for a long time. In his statement, Henry Kissinger is indirectly telling us the order in which they're doing things in. First of all, they're going to go for control of the money supply, then they're going to go for the energy companies and utilities, and then they're going to go for the food supply and the farmers. It's no coincidence that we've seen over 30 massive chemical spills and huge food production plants going up in flames over the last two months. Because as Sun Tzu said in The Art of War, an evil enemy will burn his own nation to the ground to rule over the ashes, and this is precisely what we're dealing with. Indeed, it was JFK who said it best when he addressed the people and said, If you are awaiting a finding of clear and present danger, then I can only say that the danger has never been more clear, and its presence has never been more imminent. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. It conducts the Cold War in short. With a wartime discipline, no democracy would ever hope or wish to match. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And for those who are skeptical and think this might just be an American thing, I can assure you it's not and that all the world's leaders know about it. They are constantly flashing up signs to indicate who they are to other members. The skeptical Brits might be a bit shocked at this. And some people will say as I, as I leave office, that this is the end of they, they, yep, they will they will say this is the end of Brexit. They will oh yes. Listen to deathly hush. <laughs> deathly hush. Uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the leader of the opposition and the, and the deep state will prevail in its plot to haul us back into alignment with the EU as a prelude uh, to our eventual return. Even the British Prime Minister is powerless to do anything against them. We penetrate the cabinets. In the secret covenant that was believed to be written by J.D. Rockefeller, he said, an illusion it will be so large, so vast, it will escape their perception. Those who will see it will be thought of as insane. We will create separate fronts to prevent them from seeing the connection between us. We will behave as if we are not connected to keep the illusion alive. We will establish their governments and establish opposites within. We will own both sides, drop by drop, 
Drop by drop, we will advance our goal. We will take over their land, resources and wealth to exercise total control over them. We will deceive them into accepting laws that will steal the little freedom they will have. We will establish a money system that will imprison them forever, keeping them and their children in debt. It was J.D. Rockefeller and his associates that created the Securities and Exchange Commission in 1934. Its purpose was to ensure that no one else in America had the authority to print currency. After having instigated World War I for the purpose of lining their own pockets from ammunition sales, they then went on to manufacture fact to the stock market bubble of the 1920s which eventually led to the Great Depression in 1929 where they used the war chest that they'd accumulated during World War One to buy up all the distressed corporations in America and used the Great Depression as a poor excuse to steal all the gold of all the citizens in the United States. However, because this was so successful for them, they then went on to finance Hitler and his Nazi party in order to instigate a war in Europe to drain the European countries of their gold reserves, which was the entire point of World War II. They would then swoop in to scoop up all the European corporations that Hitler had decimated for them, and at the same time put in European leaders that would be useful for their requirements at a later date. The Second World War would conclude with their consolidation of the financial system under their control due to the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944. They then simply stopped supplying Hitler and the war very quickly finished the following year in 1945. They would then exert their economic power to enact financial and political reform in Thailand, South Korea, Indonesia and Japan. And we all know what happened to the countries that resisted. Now, you'd think with all their economic power and political dominance that they would be pretty much unstoppable. However, something recently appears to have spooked them. If you want to find the evidence that Moderna was working on the vaccine before the virus ever emanated out of the lab, if you wanted to find the collusions and the operations between the Gates Foundation and Gavi and CEPI and Pfizer and Moderna and the vaccine manufacturers and the Wuhan lab and the National Institutes of Health and Ralph Barrick and University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and how all this was organized, if you want to see the Johns Hopkins planning seminar, called the SPARS pandemic in 2017. They published this. It says it's going to be a coronavirus. It's going to be related to MERS and SARS. It's going to come over here to the United States. It's going to shut down cities and frighten people. There's going to be confusion regarding a drug, hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin. And we're going to utilize all that in order to railroad the population into mass vaccination. The only thing they got wrong was the year. They said it was going to be 2025. Instead, it landed a few years early. Now why would they feel the need to put such a large operation at risk and move it forward five years? Maybe it's because they felt that they had to. Now why would that be? Let's return back to Henry Kissinger's quote where he said, Who controls money controls the world. If they thought they were potentially about to lose control of money, this would be a rational explanation for their decision. So what is money? Money has to be a commodity. A commodity must have no human barrier to entry to accessing it. It must have a use case to generate value so that it can then be used as a medium of exchange for the trade of goods and services of a similar value. If something is useful, it is valuable. If something is useless, it is worthless. A medium of exchange is a tool that enables, encourages and accelerates the facilitation of trade. Because it is a tool, it is economically competitive and therefore there will eventually only be one, as people will simply use the tool that facilitates trade in the best way. So. When a commodity monopolizes a market due to its ability to be used as a medium of exchange, it becomes a monopoly commodity and recognized as money. A commodity is a common item that has been through the process of commoditization, which is effectively a process of standardization. So it's first of all something that's common, that's then been itemized and then uniquely identified. So it can then be given a market value and measured against the cost of other goods and services within the economy. Now money cannot be a commodity that is grown, because otherwise people would just simply grow as much money as they could. It therefore has to be a commodity that is extracted, fixed in supply and yet can be divisible amongst everybody in the economy. Prior to the 15th of August 1971, the commodity that the financial world ran on was gold. And as JP Morgan famously quoted in 1912, gold is money, everything else is credit. And so by stealing all the gold off the American citizens in 1933 and extracting all the gold from the European countries in World War II, the cabal effectively had control of money. However, in order to create the money system that Rockefeller spoke of when he said, we will establish a money system that will imprison them forever, keeping them and their children in debt, meant they somehow had to make money worthless. They did this by securitizing gold and initially using gold certificates as a medium of exchange. These gold certificates eventually turned into what we now know as currency. But later on, this currency would have its peg to the gold standard removed, turning the currency that we use today 
into securities fraud and made it economically worthless. But because they didn't want people referring to it as securities fraud, they gave it a new name. They called it fiat currency. And this is the moment it happened. We must protect the dollar from the attacks of international money speculators. We are going to take that action, not timidly, not half-heartedly, and not in piecemeal fashion. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. To our friends abroad, including the many responsible members of the international banking community who are dedicated to stability and the flow of trade, I give this assurance. The United States has always been and will continue to be a forward-looking and trustworthy trading partner. Even Nixon, being a seasoned politician, had trouble hiding his own lie. The famous case that defines fiat currency as securities fraud is that of the SEC versus W.J. Howey Co. 1946 and was ruled on by the Supreme Court. The only reason fiat currency hasn't been challenged is because up until now there hasn't been an alternative. You can compare these two $1 notes. The first one says silver certificate, one silver dollar, whereas those words have now been replaced with Federal Reserve Note, one dollar. Because the currency they print has absolutely no value, they can pretty much print as much as they like. And the more they print, the less valuable it becomes against the cost of goods and services in the economy, which leads to increased prices and economic hardship. You can see here in 2020 that five times more currency was printed than has ever existed in modern day financial history. There is no justification for this level of currency printing ever. This is economic terrorism on a scale that is totally unprecedented and never been seen or witnessed before. The cabal are trying to fool us by saying that inflation has been caused by economic factors such as supply and demand caused by the war in Ukraine. But in actual fact, it couldn't be more further from the truth. So why are they moving so fast? What are they so concerned about? It's because when the internet came along, paper money went digital, meaning the medium of exchange was now as fast and as efficient as light. And since there is nothing in the universe that is faster and more efficient than light, they thought that nothing would surpass their central banking system. What they hadn't counted on was the possibility that digital data could actually be commoditized. And this is where Bitcoin enters the arena. The Bitcoin white paper was released on the 31st of October 2008 and expressed for the first time in history how to commoditize digital data. The system does this by producing a fixed supply of non fungible tokens, otherwise known as NFTs, called Bitcoin. And these tokens are divisible by up to 16 or more decimal places. It's this Bitcoin that pays for and carries with it your own personal data when you upload it onto the network. And because this data is fixed in supply, it becomes increasingly valuable as more and more people start to use it. And the reason people will start to use it is to protect and have sovereignty over their own digital data. So how is this possible? A commodity network that can provide sovereignty over your own data is made up of five elements. First of all, the asset that economically sustains the network must be fixed in supply. If it's fixed in supply, it means that no one can change it and therefore no one controls it. Secondly, it must have a locked protocol. A protocol is the rule set that the digital network is built upon. In the same way that houses are built on foundations, digital networks are built on protocols. They are the rule set. And again, if that is locked, it means that no one can change it and therefore no one controls it. Thirdly, the capacity of the network must be unbounded so that limitations and restrictions cannot be manufactured and therefore cannot be manipulated. If it cannot be manipulated, it means that no one can change it and therefore no one controls it. Fourth, the the network must be economically competitive. Without competition, you simply get collusion and centralization. So an economically competitive network means no one controls it. And last of all, the network must produce common accountability. This means that all users of the network are equally accountable, meaning no one could do anything on the network that nobody else would know about. This means that those who maintain the network do not control the network. And after this, we have a completely common network with no central point of authority, control or failure. And it's because of this that the network then needs to be protected externally by patents. It's the common accountability that the cabal fear the most, because eventually it will expose the living men and women behind their veil of corporations. It's currently their occult use of their corporations and the central banking network that enables them to conduct their crimes, without accountability. This is because it's money that enables the mobilization of resources. If money is ultimately traceable, it means that responsibility can then ultimately be pinpointed so you have nothing to fear if you're not doing anything wrong. The Bitcoin network is private, where essentially controlled systems are anonymous. And the difference between anonymity and privacy is this. 
Anonymity is what you would seek if you were in the toilet cubicle. Nobody knows you're in there, you can do your business, and nobody knows what you've done. Whereas privacy is what you and your partner would seek behind the bedroom door. You can both identify each other, you can engage with each other, but no third party can see, hear, or interfere. However, if a dispute arises that they can't resolve themselves, they can ultimately present the evidence to a third party who can resolve the dispute for them. The chain of signatures in Bitcoin ultimately looks a bit like this. So although party one has traded with party two, and party 2 has traded with party 3, party 1 has no idea about party 3 and vice versa, but party 2 is a witness to both. So at scale, transactions on the network will look a little bit like white noise. The amount of resources that would have to go into tracing a particular transaction would be absolutely huge and therefore would have to be worthwhile. Therefore, if you're a living man or woman living in the private, going about your business, buying your groceries and going on holiday, nobody's really going to be bothered about your transactions. However, if you're committing crimes against humanity, paying for the spraying of chemicals or all over the world and involved in child trafficking, well then that's a different story altogether. The effort will be put in to find you and you will eventually be traced. And this is precisely what the cabal don't want. The use of Bitcoin will eventually expose their entire network and we'll eventually be able to see who it is that sits at the top. So what's happened to Bitcoin so far and what have the cabal done to try and stop it? Well first of all the Bitcoin network itself had to go through the process of commoditization. This is why the Bitcoin white paper was released on the 31st of October 2008, in order to provide a common and equal opportunity for anyone and everyone to start the network themselves. After a reasonable amount of time had been provided, the author of the white paper started the network himself under a pseudonym. Starting the network under a pseudonym allowed the network to grow organically without any central point of authority, control or influence, which adds to the network's credibility as being classified as a commodity. As the network grows, it's economic competition that dilutes the centralised starting point over time. It was really important that this happened before the author reveal himself. This time in Bitcoin's history could be classified as the speculative phase because nobody really knew what Bitcoin was besides the creator himself. Even the cabal didn't know what it was. All they knew is that if they restricted it would give them time to figure it out, and they could then concoct a plan to get rid of it. The first person that Satoshi Nakamoto transacted with on the Bitcoin network was a suspected CIA operative called Hal Finney. It was Hal Finney that persuaded Satoshi Nakamoto to put the one megabyte block cap in place, and it was this restriction that would enable the manipulation of the network through manufactured limitations years later. Satoshi didn't design Bitcoin with any limitations, as can be seen here from one of his earliest emails to Mike Hearn on the 12th of April 2009. He said, the existing the existing Visa credit card network processes about 15 million internet purchases per day worldwide. Bitcoin can already scale much larger than that with existing hardware for a fraction of the cost. It never really hits a scaling ceiling. Far from being a cryptocurrency, Bitcoin is actually the asset that economically sustains the world's first digital commodity network. A commodity data network is important because it has no central point of authority, control or failure. A network is either centrally controlled or economically competitive. Bitcoin is the asset that miners compete for when processing uploads onto the network. The cost of the upload is paid for in Bitcoin, and the cost is dependent on the amount of data being uploaded. For example, movies, videos, music tracks, pictures, podcasts, books or text files, etc. Bitcoin is the asset that is extracted from the network by the miners, who are incentivized to compete for it by the benefits that it offers. Those benefits are economic efficiencies in terms of data integrity and security, and the personal data sovereignty. Because the network is economically competitive and globally distributed without a central point of control, those who use the network own and control their own data. This means that content creators can now own their own work and benefit from its sale and global distribution. The reason to purchase Bitcoin is to use its network and the demand for the use of its network is reflected in its price, which then enables it to be used as a medium of exchange in the exchange of goods and services. The Bitcoin network will eventually replace the likes of Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Cloud, as everybody will be uploading and storing their data on the Bitcoin network for the cost of a micropayment rather than a monthly fee. And when they upload their data onto the Bitcoin network, they can own and control it. This is made possible because it's the value of Bitcoin that continues to rise, meaning those who economically sustain the network can continue to do so in the same way that any business can if they adopt an asset-based monetary system rather than a debt-based one. Using a debt-based system where the medium of exchange continues to decline in value means that unless you can increase your prices in line with inflation or reduce your overheads in line with inflation, you're constantly fighting an uphill battle to stay profitable and in business. Whereas if you're using an asset-based monetary system that continues to increase in value, small businesses can then survive and thrive. Whereas this is again what the cabal don't want. Any businesses that they don't already own and control, they want rid of or to take 
over. The Bitcoin network is by far the most efficient and most secure data network on Earth, which means all these businesses you see here will eventually be using the Bitcoin network to process their own payment services. So not only will they be purchasing Bitcoin to save themselves millions if not billions of dollars on data efficiencies and data securities, they'll also be purchasing it as an asset that's increasing in value to use as a medium of exchange at a later date. Bitcoin is quite simply the most valuable commodity on Earth and it's the smartest people who will recognise this and move first. Here's how it works. First of all, the digital information and the signature that make up the transaction data are broadcast to the network. That is then put through the SHA-256 hash function that scrambles the data to the magnitude of 2 to the power of 256, and the transaction is then assigned a hash number. The hash number is created from a previous bit of data that's been uploaded that links the transactions together. The network that the transaction is broadcast to is structured in the form of a mandala network which is one of the most efficient network structures on Earth. This means that a moment a node picks up the transaction, it's never more than six hops away from every single node on the network recognising it. The moment more than 50% of the nodes recognise the transaction, which is instantly, the transaction is then thrown into the memory pool. Once in the memory pool, miners then compete to process the transaction by building a block and finding SHA-256. The SHA-256 that they're looking for is that of the first transaction that entered the memory pool. It's this transaction that has the Bitcoin block reward programmed into it, and its hash number is created from the block header of the previous block. Once a miner finds SHA-256, the block is then capped, a block header created, and the miner is then rewarded with the Bitcoin block reward, along with all the fees attached to each of the transactions that are within the block. And the process is then repeated. This is a diagram illustrating Bitcoin's distribution model. You can see here that the Bitcoin block reward started out at 50 Bitcoins per block and the block reward is cut in half every 210,000 blocks, which is very close to every four years. This is because a block is created approximately every 10 minutes. So the block reward went from 50 Bitcoins to 25 to 12.5, and we're currently at 6.25 Bitcoins per block, with the next halving expected around April 2024. So as the block reward continues to get cut in half every 210,000 blocks, what's required is for the block fee to surpass the block reward, and then we have an economically self-sustaining system, which is what we are gunning for and this is precisely what the cabal are trying to prevent. If there are not enough fees in the block from the transaction volume, the miners will simply not be able to economically sustain themselves and the system will eventually collapse. But as of this date, the 6th of March 2023, Bitcoin is absolutely smashing it with over 81.9% of the entire market's transaction volume on its network, which makes BTC, Ethereum and XRP look absolutely pathetic. So why am I referring to Bitcoin as BSV? Well, let me explain what the cabal have done. Bitcoin first started out in 2009 with the ticker symbol BTC and had all the five elements in place for it to be considered a digital commodity. But in 2017, a group of developers mysteriously appeared from out of nowhere and proposed changing how the protocol of Bitcoin was structured. They named this alteration SegWit. So the chain was split on the 1st of August 2017 and SegWit was implemented on the 24th of August of the same year. The developer's excuse was that it was better to fundamentally change Bitcoin rather than to simply increase the block size to fit more transactions in. However, what they didn't tell people it was by segregating the digital signatures from the transaction data would remove all economic value and contractual credibility from the network, rendering it economically worthless. You see, sending a transaction in Bitcoin is like sending a contract of value. And in the same way that a valid contract requires two signatures, a transaction of Bitcoin also requires two signatures in order to authenticate it. Otherwise, you're receiving nothing more than numbers on a screen. With the digital signatures segregated from the transaction data, legal recourse simply cannot be re-attained. It also means that the group of developers who implemented SegWit now have control of the digital signatures, meaning they could reassign blame nefariously should somebody be uploading naughty images of children if they wanted to. It also means they can make further changes to the Bitcoin protocol without anybody knowing about it. So in one foul swoop, the developers were able to remove all economic value and contractual credibility from the network by taking central control of it. And coincidentally, in October of the same year, the Spars pandemic would be published that would simulate a global lockdown due to a virus. Now, there's only two ways to get rid of Bitcoin. One is to try and prevent people from using it. And secondly, install a totalitarian one world government and simply ban it. It appears the cabal are going for both, which simply shows how much of a threat it is to their network. Segwit turned BTC from a digital commodity into an economically worthless illegal security offering. Luckily, Satoshi was wise to what they were up to and oversaw the continuing of the Bitcoin protocol but under a new ticker symbol. It was given the ticker symbol BCH and stood for Bitcoin Cash. However, because that didn't work, another group of developers proposed to attack the signatures again, causing yet another chain split. And they again stole the name and the ticker symbol, meaning the original protocol and genuine Bitcoin had to change its name and ticker symbol again. This time it was called Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, abbreviated to Bitcoin 
Bitcoin SV and have the ticker symbol BSV. BSV remains the world's only digital commodity and it's the only network that's been through the process of commoditization. Meaning it's the only digital commodity amongst an entire market of economically worthless illegal security offerings. The Cabal have allowed an entire market of economically worthless securitized protocols to develop and they currently sit with a market cap of over one trillion dollars and they serve no other purpose other than to distract people away from the original protocol and genuine Bitcoin that threatens their economic power and dominance. As Gary Gensler recently stated, all crypto tokens except for Bitcoin are securities. It's going to come as a shock to many that Bitcoin is BSV. Another thing they did is got Mark Zuckerberg to change the name of his company from Facebook to Meta. So if you ever wondered why, this is the reason. The name given to the Bitcoin network when being used in the same way as the internet is the MetaNet. Its name was derived from metadata, which is the data that remains after the initial data has been deleted. And since nothing on the Bitcoin network can be deleted, an appropriate name for it was MetaNet. And so to defeat the cabal, all we have to do is start using it. The Bitcoin network can be used for every single digital service, including phone calls. As Dr. Wright informed us on the 22nd of October 2022, the last of the patents related to scaling have been filed yesterday. The research shows we can scale to over 10 to the power of 11 transactions per second. The cost will be under one thousandth of a US dollar, a standard transaction. That is 100 times lower than any transaction processing system ever created. Sorry, blockchain scales. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Dr. Wright, he won a court case on the 6th of December 2021, where a Florida jury found that he did not owe half of the Satoshi coins to the estate of David Kleiman. This case was reported on by the mainstream press, and the Times newspaper published an article titled, Bitcoin founder Craig Wright wins battle to keep his crypto billions, and The Guardian also published an article titled, Australian man Craig Wright wins US court battle for Bitcoin fortune worth billions. Of course, the cabal don't want you to know this and do all they can to smear his name. So let's have a look at the figures that represent the health of the network. It's the block size that represents the amount of data being uploaded onto the network. The data is uploaded via the transactions. The transactions are processed by the nodes that create blocks and supply the hash rate. The hash rate represents the processing power and the level of investment. And so the hash rate is attracted to the value which is meant to be representative of the price. But the price is currently speculative because people don't have a clue what Bitcoin really is. But when education catches up with speculation, you can guarantee the speculative prices will soon start to match the fundamental values. And so the most important fundamental fundamental figures to look at is the block size and the transactions because the network nodes, the hash rate and the price will simply follow. And as you can see the genuine Bitcoin has over 95% of the block size and 96% of the transaction volume. Of course the cabal just simply want the plebs to focus on the price and have no real fundamental understanding of what Bitcoin is because the secret of freedom lies in educating people whereas the secret of tyranny is in keeping them ignorant. The cabal are desperate to get rid of the genuine Bitcoin and have run many delist BSV campaigns encouraging exchanges to delist List it. This has allowed them to steal the BSV from the exchange's customers and put selling pressure on the price to keep it suppressed. And so one of the easiest ways I've found to purchase it is through Rock Wallet that can be found at www.rockwallet.com. Rock Wallet allows the purchase of BSV anywhere in the world with a credit and a debit card. You simply download the app, follow the instructions, purchase Bitcoin, and you'll find it in your wallet almost instantly. To start learning about Bitcoin, there are more videos linked in the description. There is a brief history of Bitcoin, the rise and rise of Craig Wright, shining a light on sovereign and electronic cash, farmers, food supply and money, getting started in Bitcoin and what happened to Bitcoin. Hopefully with your increase in knowledge and learning about Bitcoin, together we can defeat the cabal. I wish you love and light and all the best in everything. Remember, Bitcoin is BSV. Everything else is BS.